Well, our next guest is someone who's going to inspire you. His name is Dr. Matthew Spaulding. He is the Associate Vice President and Dean of Educational Programs for Healdsdale College in Washington, D.C. As such, he oversees the operations of the Kirby Center and the various academic and educational programs in Hillsdale and in the nation's capital. He is the best-selling author of We Still Hold These Truths, Rediscovering Our Principles, Reclaiming Our Future. Dr. Spaulding also is Executive Director of the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. Prior to joining Hillsdale, he was founding director of its B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. Please welcome Dr. Matthew Spaulding. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Schuler. Um, thank my friend David. He did inform me that I was going to follow a pastor. So, you, 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 my friends, you have to pray for me. Uh, and Dr. Schuler, I, I, I would say I have been to the Crystal Cathedral, and I'm from California. So that's it's wonderful to be here, be here with you. I'm a historian, uh, so I'm going to begin with a story because uh, what history does for us is it tells us stories and it inspires us. Uh, it explains things to us, and it makes us think about what we are deciding and doing today because we are those that the past, the future will look back as history. My story is about a young man named Levi Preston. I found him when I was doing my work for my book. He was a young man, unmarried, in his teens, and he ended up at a place in history called Concord Bridge. If you recall, the British had occupied Boston, and they were going to leave Boston to try to find munitions being held and hidden by those rebels. And so they went out, and they crossed the water. Someone had seen them, a signal from the old North Church, so they had been warned by a name, man named Paul Revere. They went through Lexington where the first shots were fired. They got to Cor Concord, there's a bridge there. It's a small bridge. I've taken my children. There were fewer people at that bridge than are in this room. And yet the British were coming at them with thousands, mounted, fully armed. And so a historian later asked Levi Preston, this young boy who had a gun his father had given him from the French Indian War, didn't quite work right, why'd you fight? Why were you there that morning? One of those questions we don't think about because, you see, we have hindsight. We know what happened. When I tell that story, everyone relates to it. Most people. You've heard it. But you know what happened. The question is, why did he go there that morning? So the historian asked Levi Preston, did you object to the Stamp Act? Right? The colonists were being taxed. They had to pay their taxes and get stamped. I didn't object to that, he said. What about the tea tax? Did you object to the tax on your tea? Levi Preston said, I didn't drink tea myself, didn't like it. <laughs> well, how about all those fancy books of theory and Republican ideas? And Levi Preston said, I didn't read any of those books. I read the Bible, I read the Psalms, I read the Farmer's Almanac. Well, why then did you go to fight? This historian asked Levi Preston. And Preston turned to the historian and said, it was rather simple. We'd always governed ourselves. We intended to govern ourselves. And those British didn't think that we should. End of story. We have hindsight. We look back at history and we know what happened. The question is how to look at history and look at those ideas and things that were fought for and realize they didn't know what was going to happen. History is made up of turning points. Key to a turning point is not knowing what will happen. And my friends, we are at a turning point today in our nation's history. The word crisis comes from the Latin. It means decision. We are at a point in our country's history where we must begin to make decisions about the important things, the most important, the most fundamental things. I want to say a few, about, a few words about America. 
about the fundamental things about America. We oftentimes think America and history is very complicated. We have to have PhDs from fancy universities. But it's actually quite simple. This is an exceptional country, not because of its strength or its military power, not because of its economy, but because of the ideas behind it, because of its beginnings. The American narrative is an, inter, uh, is an interwoven tapestry centered upon two documents, very simple. The United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It reached back to all sorts of history, which we could talk about at great length. British history, Greek and Roman history, it's all there. But what constitutes us are these two documents. The Declaration of Independence announces our independence, yes. It has all sorts of complaints about the British king, yes. But it's its statement of principles. It's that old statement of principles. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They wanted to fight against the British king, those Americans. They wanted their rights as Englishmen. But you can't beat the English king by claiming the rights of Englishmen. So they did something different. They looked behind that. They reached back in history behind it. And they said, we are men. And we are endowed with those rights. And all of us have them. And you can't take them away. It was this argument of nature they used, of human nature. There was something common among all of us and universal, our very humanness. We are different. We're not like the animals. We talk, we deliberate, we preach, we communicate, we make choices, we pursue the good, we understand justice, we pursue ends and purposes, virtues. Yes, we have a weak nature, we follow our passions, but we can come above that. The Declaration's most important lines we hold these truths to be self-evident, come right after another claim. Read that thing. It's based on what? It refers to the laws of nature and nature's God. Reason? Yes. Revelation. All men are created equal, and they're endowed with these rights. The sacred rights that we refer to, a young Alexander Hamilton wrote in one document, are not to be rummaged for in old musty documents. That's not where you'll find them. They are written as a sunbeam on the whole volume of human nature by the hand of the divinity and can never be erased by mortal power. That's why America is exceptional. And it's not America. It's the ideas. It's those things. And it's because of that that we are equal. We are equally human. We're endowed with the same rights. None is born with a saddle on his back. And no one else is born booted and spurred, ready to ride. The Constitution, beautiful document, a flawed document, but a beautiful thing. Frederick Douglass loved the Constitution, not because it allowed for the existence of slavery, which was a violation of the Declaration, and they all knew it, but because the document allowed that thing to be gotten rid of because it looked back to the Declaration. Abraham Lincoln, the great Lincoln, explained the, the connection and the relationship between the Declaration and the Constitution by looking to Proverbs. A word fitly spoken is like an apple of gold and a frame of silver. 
the word fitly spoken about America is in the Declaration of Independence. The frame is the Constitution. We argue all the time about our Constitution. We think all our problems are legal, politics. We got to look behind that to the apple of gold, and we forget it's there. Today, all these questions, all is questioned. Too much today we talk about politics. Too much of our t t t politics today is about who's doing what to whom. Yes, government does too much. There's too much bureaucracy. Everyone has a complaint about government. That's dehumanizing. Because what America is supposed to be about is about self-governing, not about rules and regulations. It's the thing that's behind it that's the most important thing. We're producing flat-souled people. C.S. Lewis talked about that. They're flat-souled because we are not upholding and following the principles laid out before us in our founding. We cannot be fully human unless we govern ourselves. The choices, the choices that make up history, it's the choosing in which you find virtue and character. Because unless you don't choose it yourself, it is not something you pursue. We have our freedom, our liberty, in order to do that. That's what religious liberty is all about. And behind that, in our problem today, is we increasingly reject this idea of nature, the thing with which we are endowed. We don't think there are permanent truths. Everything is changeable. We look back, and it's merely history, what people thought in the past. But I have to tell you, if it's not true now, it wasn't true then. And, it wasn't, and if it wasn't true then, why do we talk about it so much? Why is this country worth saving? The claims made of the American founders, as imperfect as they were, they claim them because they believe them to be universally true. They weren't true merely in 1776. They weren't merely true in the colonies of British North America. They weren't merely true for whites, but for everyone. When Lincoln looked to solve the problem of slavery, he looked to the Declaration. Because there, the universal truth had been embedded in the very fiber of the country. And that was the truth that saved it. Yes, we have come to a, a time of crisis, a time in which we have to make decisions and choose as a people. How do we wish to govern ourselves? Do we wish to govern ourselves by principles, informed by moral truth? Or do we wish to merely go along to get along, increasingly turning more and more things over to someone else and not being responsible for ourselves? The liberties created by our Constitution are meant to allow as much room as possible after the things that we need government to do for the self-governing institutions, the private institutions, the communities, and especially for the family to shape our characters. Because self-government means two things. It means we govern ourselves as a people, but we also govern the self. And they knew that. The phrase the American founders like to use for the family, they called it the seminary of the republic. It's a place where citizens are formed. Because citizens are about moral character. 
The truths of the American founding are often obscured by history. We take it for granted because we know what happened. Why did Washington cross the Delaware? It's not an interesting question. We knew we made it. Why did Levi Preston fight at Concord? Why did all those men die at Gettysburg? Why did we fight the Second World War to free a continent? And then all the little things. Think of the people you knew and know. History becomes obscured. As a result, we don't see the principles behind that history for which they acted. We have an imperfect country, yes. But it is a great country. And it's hard to see a greater one because of its central principles. Our politics are divided. Our people are divided because they're confused. What we need now more than ever is clarity, conviction. That's what calls forth leadership. Do you ever notice that great leaders have a gift to speak directly to the problem, speak directly to the truth? Let me end with another story. Falls on the first. After the Battle of Concord, those Americans fought back. They pushed the British. The British ran all the way back to Boston. The British went back to their ships. The Americans went into Boston, Charleston, to a very weak position, a place called Bunker Hill. The British wouldn't allow that stand. They attacked them. First, repulsed. Second, again. Third time, they completely overwhelmed them. The man in charge of Bunker Hill was named Joseph Warren. Young man, widowed, wife had died, father of eight children. The leaders of the revolution, the Hancocks and the Adams, they had fled to save, to save the revolution. Joseph Warren stayed behind. When the British overwhelmed the American position at Bunker Hill, they captured Joseph Warren. They knew who he was, what he was doing, what he stood for, and they immediately shot him in the head. I'm going to leave you with a few words that Joseph Warren wrote a few weeks before he was killed. Our streets, he said, are filled with armed men. Our harbor is crowded with ships of war, but these cannot intimidate us. Our liberties must be preserved because it's far dearer than our life. No longer can we reflect on the actions of our forefathers if but for a moment we entertain the thought of giving up. Our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. Our enemies are numerous and powerful, but we have many friends determining to be free, and heaven and earth will aid in the resolution. On you, he said, on you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question on which rests the happiness and liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. We must not despair. We don't need to despair. The ideas of America, the ideas of human liberty, the I principles themselves are etched on the human soul. Our job is merely to reawaken it, 
because in reawakening it, we will find renewal. Our task, despite all the threats and challenges around us, is to keep focused on the most fundamental things, knowing that these ideas at the center of America are the eternal truths of the laws of nature and nature's God. We must rekindle the things that George Washington said make up the sacred fire of liberty. Act worthy. Thank you.